Good afternoon, and welcome to the FEMA Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness webinar series. My name is Allison Albright, and I am the Regional Preparedness Liaison for FEMA Region 2. I'm going to provide a few technical considerations before we begin. Today's proceedings are being recorded and captioned. The archived event will be available on the FEMA website in the coming weeks. You should hear audio through your computer speakers, so please ensure that your volume is turned up so you may hear the proceedings accordingly. In the top right corner, we ask if you'd like to receive news and updates from Region 2. If so, please enter your email address and we'll be sure to add you to the distribution list. We will have a question and answer session after the presentation concludes. You'll see a Q&A pod in the lower right-hand corner. Please feel free to submit your questions about the subject matter there, and time permitting, we'll do our best to answer them. Finally, the PowerPoint presentation from today will be available for you to download in the file share pod as a PDF. You can click on the file and download it using the download button. With that, I'd like to turn it over to the Region 2 Community Preparedness Officer to introduce our speaker and today's proceedings. Thanks, Allison. Wondering if our audience knows that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency's goal number one is to build a culture of preparedness. The Region 2 Individual and Community Preparedness Program is focused on preparing individuals and communities for disasters by providing useful information and training, inspiring people to take action and be ready for any emergency. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Debbie Casa, the Community Preparedness Officer for FEMA Region 2. On behalf of our team working to strengthen preparedness across the region, I'd like to welcome you to our preparedness webinar series. As part of FEMA's goal, we're pleased to be hosting today's webinar on the importance of the seasonal influenza vaccination, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our guest speaker today, Sam Greitzer, is a medical officer in the Immunization Services Division and currently serving on CDC's Vaccine Task Force. He has been with CDC since 2009, starting first as an Epidemic Intelligence Service Officer in the Influenza Division during the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, and then moving to the Immunization Services Division, where he has worked since 2011 on routine adult immunization and pandemic influenza vaccine program preparedness planning. He is board certified in emergency medicine. Sam, I'd like to turn the speaker over to you. Great, um, thank you so much. Now I see my slides. Again, my name is Sam Gratzer. I'm a medical officer in the vaccine uh, task force at CDC. Um, next slide, please. The objectives for my talk today are first to describe the number of influenza-related illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths associated with flu each year, and the impact that flu vaccination can play in reducing these numbers. I'll review the vaccination uptake levels by age, race and ethnicity, and by state and region, highlight some similarities and differences between flu and COVID-19, discuss why influenza vaccination is even more important this year, and provide a brief overview of CDC influenza communi communication campaign materials and other resources for planners and healthcare providers. Next slide, please. Each year, influenza causes a tremendous burden on illness, uh, hospitalizations, and deaths. In fact, in 2019-2020, we estimate that approximately flu caused approximately 38 million illnesses, um, resulted in more than 400,000 hospitalizations and resulted in more than 22,000 flu-related deaths. Next slide, please. Influenza vaccination is really the most important way to protect against getting a, um, a flu infection. Um, even though only about half of the U.S. population over six months old got vaccinated last year, we estimate that this still prevented more than 7.5 uh, million flu-related illnesses. That's um, the size of Kentucky and Kansas state populations combined. It prevented more than 100,000 hospitalizations and prevented estimated more than 6,000 deaths. The goal, of course, is to get vaccination way above 50% in all populations. Next slide. Now, influenza vaccination coverage does vary by age group and by population. In general, 
among children, vaccination tends to be higher than in adult populations. This uh, slide shows influenza vaccination for children um, for the last nine flu seasons. Um, you'll see that vaccinations tend to be higher in the younger age groups here in purple. Um, children aged six months to four years of age are um, uh, typically about 75% of them are vaccinated against flu. Whereas among the adolescent populations, vaccination drops substantially and only about half of um, adolescents get vaccinated. You see here in, in um, orange at 53.2%. Next slide, please. Now there is variability among um, state vaccination as well. This slide shows vaccination among the pediatric populations last season. On the left are states with lower vaccination coverage and on the right are states with higher vaccination coverage. I noted a, a couple of states for region two um, that with the blue, green areas here with New York having a vaccination of 69.6% .6 and uh, New Jersey at 72.3%. Uh, next slide, please. Now, as I stated before, uh, adults tend to have lower vaccination um, rates than children um, for flu. Um, the one exception is in the uh, elderly population where vaccination uh, among those 65 years in age are, are, um, and higher are about almost 70 percent. Um, unfortunately, among younger populations in 18 to 49, vaccination is really even less than 40 percent. You'll see 18 to 49 vaccinations at 38.4 percent. Next slide, please. There is also variability uh, among states in terms of adult population. Again, on this slide, states with lower vaccination are on the left and states with higher vaccination on the right. Again, I've included green arrows to highlight a few states and specific to region two. Um, even though some states are higher than others, vaccination overall is far lower than where it needs to be. Typically, we aim to have vaccination higher than 100%, uh, higher than 70%, um, and even at the highest state, it's only at 56%. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, there's also disparity and differences in vaccination among racial and ethnic groups. This slide shows vaccination by race and ethnic group for the last nine influenza seasons. Um, you'll see that um, in purple, white non-Hispanic groups tend to have higher vaccination, though still low at just over 50 percent. Um, but lower vaccination is uh, appreciated in Hispanic populations at 38.3 percent and African Americans at black non-Hispanics at 41.2 percent. Next slide, please. Now, not surprisingly, we also see corresponding differences in flu-related hospitalizations among race and ethnicity. This graph shows data from one of CDC's flu surveillance systems called FluServeNet, um, and it shows age-adjusted influenza-associated hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity combined since uh, 2009. Um, Non-Hispanic Blacks, non-Hispanic American Indian or Alaska Natives, and Hispanic or Latino groups have hospitalization rates significantly higher than non-Hispanic Whites. Um, the highest hospitalization rates among non-Hispanic Blacks at 68.1 per 100,000 population. Next slide, please. So let's move on and talk a little bit about some of the, uh, a high level um, discussion about some of the similarities and differences between flu and COVID-19. Next slide, please. So there are obviously a number of similarities in terms of symptoms. Um, both flu and COVID-19 typically can have symptoms such as a fever or feeling feverish or chills. Cough is very common in both, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, fatigue or tiredness, sore throat, runny nose, muscle pain, and headache. Both also can, have, can be associated with vomiting and diarrhea. So especially in children, this is much more, com uh, um, much more common for flu. Um, there is an important difference. Um, in COVID-19, the, uh, the loss or change in smell is much more common than in flu. Next slide, please. Um, there are also differences in terms of time for symptom onset. So for flu, um, symptoms typically develop around one to four days after infection from the flu virus. For COVID-19, um, symptoms tend to develop about five days after being infected with the um, SARS-CoV-2 virus. But symptoms, if they do develop, can appear as early as two days 
um, after infection and up to 14 days after infection. Next slide, please. There's also differences in terms of um, contagiousness or how long someone can spread the virus. For flu, uh, most flu um, um, infections uh, are contagious for about one day, are contagious about one day before symptoms. Um, in older children and adults, flu um, seems to be most contagious during the initial three to four days of um, illness, but people can remain contagious for about seven days. Now, for COVID-19, a lot of this is still under investigation, um, but what we, what we think is that it's possible to spread the virus even up to two days before signs or symptoms, if, um, if they do develop, and a person can remain contagious even beyond 10 days after signs and symptoms. Um, if asymptomatic or symptoms go away, they can remain um, contagious for at least uh, 10 days after a positive test as well. Next slide, please. There are also differences in terms of vaccination. Um, and this is a hot topic right now. So for flu, there are multiple FDA licensed influenza vaccines that have a long history of being used um, across the general population. Um, each year, these flu vaccines um, contain multiple strains of influenza virus, so up to four influenza strains that scientists believe are the, are the, the strains that be circulating in the season. Now, for COVID-19, there are currently no um, authorized or approved vaccines. We, we all know and we've seen in media there's a lot of uh, work with vaccine developers and research, researchers to get safe vaccine out. Um, and, and we expect that probably within the week we're going to have a lot more to say about this as well. Um, so next slide. Now, both both uh, flu and COVID um, hospitalization are associated with having one or more comorbid conditions. This uh, slide is really an interesting slide that compares the, uh, the number of comorbid conditions for hospitalization between flu and COVID-19. You'll see there's a lot of similarities. So flu is in blue and COVID-19. Um, is in yellow. So for things like asthma, um, chronic lung disease, and diabetes or metabolic disorders uh, and neurologic disorders, there are a lot of similarities in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the risk for having a uh, hospitalization for having these, um, these conditions. Um, obesity also um, is very common among most groups. Now, interestingly, um, hypertension is, mu is much more specific and unique to COVID-19. Um, and we don't know a lot of the reasons for this right now, but a lot of this is under investigation. Um, but there's an important um, similarity and difference between COVID-19 that I just wanted to highlight to the, to the group on the call today. Next slide, please. So let's move on and talk a little bit about vaccination during this year, during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So, a lot of the times, researchers use influenza activity in the hum southern hemisphere to predict or get a sense of what influenza activity is going to be like in the northern hemisphere. Um, this year, we have noticed dramatically lower um, rates of influenza in the southern hemisphere than typical. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this, and, and it's really complex. So, first of all, fewer countries are reporting data. Um, and so fewer viruses are being detected in general. So it may be an artifact of the data. But we also know that there's a lot of social distancing and other preventive measures uh, that are ongoing to reduce the spread of SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID or COVID-19, which may also be helping to reduce some of the spread of flu viruses. Um, and also the pandemic itself may be influencing um, the way people are seeking um, 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 health care. Um, and it may also be affecting government priorities in terms of testing and the overall capacity to test. So interpreting of the data from the southern hem hemisphere is really challenging to predict um, what it's going to be like in the U.S. this year. Next slide, please. Um, it, it's really unclear in um, how the ongoing pandemic will impact the flu season this year in the U.S. Um, there may be less than, than normal influenza vaccine, uh, influenza virus, that is, um, because of social distancing and other measures to reduce COVID-19. Um, but there also may be co-circulation of influenza viruses and SARS-CoV-2. Um, and we do know that people can be co-infected with influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Um, of course, the presence of SARS-CoV-2 and influenza at the same time could place even more burden on the healthcare system that we know is already um, strained um, to its limit. Next slide, please. 
Um, we do expect, and we're seeing it now, SARS-CoV-2 is uh, continuing to circulate. Um, so influencing, increasing influenza vaccination coverage, the idea really is that this should help reduce stress on the healthcare system by decreasing doctor's visits and hospitalizations related to, to this respiratory virus. Um, we hope that also reduce the, uh, the need for influenza diagnostic testing that may be um, diverted for COVID-19 purposes. Um, now, there needs to be a really focus on influenza vaccination among adults at high risk for COVID-19. As we saw, there's a lot of similarities between, um, between flu and COVID in terms of um, high-risk conditions. Um, but also staff and residents in long-term care facilities are important um, 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 patients to get uh, the flu vaccine. Um, adults with underlying conditions, but also African Americans and Hispanics are disproportionately affected by COVID-19 this year. Um, and including adults who are part of the critical infrastructure, so essential workers and healthcare personnel. Next slide, please. So this year, we expect to have more influenza vaccine doses than we've ever had in all um, flu seasons. You can see that from the graph on the, on, on the right, this is far more than any season we've ever had before, and, and uh, almost more than 190 million doses in the U.S. market. Now, of course, there are a number of operational considerations that we need to take into account. First, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to really do targeted outreach to those that are higher risk. Um, we need to make sure we're planning um, for the need for physical distancing at vaccination sites, and that we're really focusing on influenza vaccination throughout the flu season, even as other vaccines become available. Um, and we really want to enhance our communication. So when we're doing messaging for COVID-19, this is also an opportunity to do messaging about the importance of flu vaccination and to make sure that, the, that, that those who are high risk for COVID-19 are also getting their flu vaccine. Next slide, please. So there are a number of barriers to flu vaccination during this year, during the pandemic. Um, first of all, there may be fewer worksite vaccination clinics. This is typically a, a pretty big a source um, where a lot of adults get vaccinated each year. Um, uh, people also may not feel safe going into a routine clinic or pharmacy setting. Um, In-person clinics may be canceled. Um, we already know that a lot of doctors' um, um, uh, office appointments are moved to telehealth. Um, there may be concerns in the public about safety of the COVID-19 vaccine, which could translate to more questions about safety of flu vaccine itself. Um, COVID-19 related unemployment may impact the ability of some folks to feel like the, to the afford flu vaccination. Um, and working parents may have even less free time than normal um, to focus on getting vaccinations for their, themselves and for their um, children um, because they have um, duties at work and, and added duties of homeschooling and childcare responsibilities. And also people may not think that they need a flu vaccine this year because they are already doing um, physical distancing. Next slide, please. So there are a number of activities which we can do to address some of these barriers. First of all, it's really critical that messaging um, using CDC communication material um, uh, be combined really with provider messaging, health department messaging, and among medical professional societies, um, that the importance of flu vaccine, especially this year, um, and also it's important to, to let patients know uh, where they can get um, flu shots as well. Um, patients need to know that there are pro that, that protocols are being put into place to ensure that they can be safely vaccinated in clinics. Um, we need to think about creative approaches to address um, issues to access the vaccine and disparity issues and common misperceptions about flu vaccine. Um, providers need to make sure that they're sharing information about Medicaid, the Vaccine for Children's program, which provides vaccine to um, uninsured children throughout the U.S., um, uh, information about uh, insurance subsidies, and then other payment options for patients who have recently lost insurance coverage or are experiencing economic hardship because of the pandemic. Um, and lastly, and I mentioned this before, and I'm going to reiterate it again, we want to make sure the vaccination efforts really can continue throughout the duration of the flu season. Next slide, please. So uh, I'd like to just briefly highlight on some of CDC's vac um, influenza vaccination communication materials. Next slide, please. 
as part of uh, this season's flu vaccination campaign, um, in the beginning of October, CDC published a suite of digital resources encouraging everything. And the, the, the motto this year is to hashtag mask up, uh, lather up, and roll up, and roll your sleeve up for flu vaccine um, this year. Um, the resources include, of course, their social media frames so that um, uh, stakeholders and leaders in the community can go ahead and put their own photo or picture on some of these graphics in the social media content. Um, the, there should be a hyperlink here where you can get to a lot of the, the Flu Communication Resource Center as well. So we really want to encourage you that there are providers on the call that you share um, these resources with your colleagues in your communities. Next slide, please. So this week is um, Influen National Influenza Vaccination Week, so it's a really a pleasure to address this topic to the group today. Um, this, again, there's a hyperlink specific to NIVW or the National Influenza Vaccination Week included in these slides. Um, part of this, is the, the, the point of this week is really a, an emphasis on getting flu vaccine out. Um, we've found that in previous, um, from previous flu vaccination coverage data, that few people tend to get vaccinated for flu after the end of November. Um, but it's really important that we make this late, late season push in December and beyond and throughout the holiday season. Um, people need to be vaccinated, as I said before, throughout the flu season, way into the spring if possible. Next slide, please. Um, and again, here is a number of resources, just to give you an example of the variety of, of the resources um, that we have. Um, there are resources for clinicians, um, social media toolkits, videos, uh, consumer web resources, and then and resources also in multiple languages. Next slide, please. Um, also, just for sharing purposes, there um, this is a vaccine finder, and this uh, this this is a, it is also available on CDC website, and it's a nice resource for to, for providers to show patients. Um, or how they can find flu shots available. And you could type in your address or zip code, and it can show by map and a, a list of, um, of locations in your community that um, where you can get the flu shot, but also other shots. And this is going to be a home base where patients, once COVID vaccine becomes widely available, will also be available on this website as well to, to find locations when it's available for general public. Next slide, please. Um, so this year we also um, published interim guidance for providing immunization services during the pandemic. Um, and next slide. The initial focus of the uh, of the guidance was really to, um, to 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 get pediatric and adolescent vaccination coverage levels back to where they need to be. Uh, we saw with the a lot of um, the, the sort of closures of uh, primary care health systems uh, early in the, in the clinic that there was a huge drop in pediatric, uh, pediatric and adolescent vaccination rates. And so this guidance was really was to reiterate important points about vaccination, that it's an essential medical service, um, and that vaccines uh, that are due or overdue should be immunized according to routine schedule. Um, providers really need to implement strategies to catch up with our pa to get their patients all caught up on vaccines, starting probably first with the younger age groups um, and then moving on to adolescents and adults. And it also includes guidance on, on, on providing safe delivery of vaccines, such as use of PPE and physical distancing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and, and again, these are uh, some of the themes in the guidance that um, routine vaccination really prevents disease in individuals, families, and communities. It prevents illnesses that lead to unnecessary medical visits and hospitalizations, which is especially important um, even beyond flu vaccine this year because the healthcare system is already so strained. Um, and next slide, go ahead. So one of the things that is important in the guidance is vaccine documentation, so that um, providers are really documenting vaccines as they're giving it to their patients. Um, because patients may be receiving vaccines outside of their routine medical home, it's really critical that um, vaccines are documented um, for accurate, accurate and timely information. Um, and ideally, this is done through um, a jurisdiction's vaccine registry or the, what, what we call the immunization information system, so that um, 
if a, if a patient goes to a, to a non-routine provider, their, their home provider, their medical home, their primary care physician still has access to those records and know that they're up to date. Next slide, please. So um, we've, part of this is also um, provides guidance to, to, to providers on how to implement enhanced infection control measures. So this includes screening patients for COVID symptoms before and during the visit, ensuring that, um, that clinics have physical distancing in place um, at least six feet apart, if not greater where possible, um, that there are measures in place to limit and monitor facility points of entry, that there are physical barriers to limit contact, especially in triage, um, that um, there's adequate um, uh, equipment and reinforcement of respiratory hygiene practices, such as face masks for staff, um, that there's adequate hand hygiene using appropriate hand sanitizer, and that enhanced surface decon decontamination is in place. Um, next slide, please. So as far as PPE, um, for vaccination, we recommend that all healthcare providers who are providing vaccines, uh, of course, wear a face mask. Um, we also recommend that in areas where there's moderate to substantial community transmission of COVID-19, that eye protection also be involved. Um, now, unfortunately, I think most of the U.S. now already fits in that moderate to substantial community transmission level, um, so really eye, eye protection is, is important. Now, um, for influenza vaccines that are intramuscular or subcutaneous, use of gloves is optional. But if gloves are used, they need to be changed in between patients and hand hygiene be conducted in between patients as well. Gloves are, in fact, recommended for intranasal and oral vaccines, according to the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Next slide, please. Um, and this is just an example, um, also in the guidance, about um, some strategies to ensure physical distancing during uh, vaccination visits. So, um, so for example, scheduling um, maybe well and sick visits at different times of the day um, is, a, is, a, is one strategy, um, or, uh, of course, different parts of the facility or different locations for sick and well visits. Um, and I mentioned this before, um, ensuring that there are physical um, physical aspects to ensure um, um, social distancing within the clinic. Um, and it may also be that you even want to ask patients to wait in the car um, and only be called in exactly when their appointment, when they're called um, to, to see the provider. Next slide, please. And a lot of these resources are continually being updated. So this is the link to these guidances here. Um, on the website, there's also a place where you can type in your email and get um, updates when there's updated information. Next slide, please. Um, we also have guidance for vaccination clinics that are held in uh, satellite temporary or off-site locations. Really what we mean, these are these, these clinics that are outside of a, maybe say a traditional setting such as a doctor's office. Next slide. And this is the landing page for this guidance. Um, it is broken up by planning activities, pre-clinic activities, um, activities that are conducted during the clinic, and then that are, that are um, um, after the clinic as well. Um, and there's a link to um, a nice uh, uh, checklist that can be used by clinic planners as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a screenshot of the checklist. Um, it walks through really key steps about vaccine shipment, um, receiving vaccine, storage and handling of the vaccine, um, administering vaccine in a safe manner uh, to reduce vaccine, physical vaccine injuries, um, and documentation. It links to a lot of CDC best practices on these topics. Next slide, please. And this is just an example of the planning activities from the web page. So there are components that um, have recommendations for leadership and staffing for clinics. Um, there's um, links to clinic layouts, um, locations, and about um, and information about coordination with governments and nonprofit and private sector partners. Next slide, please. Um, and we've also included flow charts for vaccination clinics. This is a flow chart for a. Um, uh, it's a layout for a walkthrough clinic, um, and you'll see there's a number of steps here. Um, there's more information on the website as well, too. Next slide, please. Um, there's also a flow chart for a curbside clinic, um, and you'll see that sometimes this, in there, this year we may see more and more drive-through clinics um, happening. 
Um, and so we want to make sure that there's some basic information available. You note that one thing here is that there's also an area to wait after vaccination that sometimes um, may not be considered um, in typical drive-through um, clinics as well. Um, but this is just really an example of, the, of a number of resources that CDC has. Um, I encourage you all to go to the website. Um, next slide, please. And then next slide. So in conclusion, I just want to reiterate influenza vaccine uh, vaccination really can have a tremendous impact in reducing doctor visits and hospitalizations and deaths every year, especially this year. Um, and it's especially important in this season, um, particularly among our most vulnerable population, the persons that have high risk medical conditions and groups that may be disproportionately affected by flu and COVID-19, um, including those in the critical um, infrastructure. Um, and again, I said it before, make sure that vaccination for flu happens throughout the season, that um, it's really not too late to get, um, get um, your flu, flu shot. And with that, I think next slide, that is my last slide. Can uh, people contact you uh, here, Sam, if they have any questions? I do have some questions for you that our audience posed, but if something comes up later, uh, is your contact information here somewhere, or it's best to just use the general information? But probably what we'll, do, what we'll do is go to the general, and then we can triage it from there, just given the volume of calls we're getting. And so we have a whole call center set up. Okay, great. So we do have some questions for you. Oops, I keep moving around, though. Uh, for COVID-19, there are people who have stayed symptomatic for months. Does that happen with the currently active influenza strain? Um, to my knowledge, no. We have not seen people that, you know, as, uh, I'm, as a clinician, um, I'll note that, that um, you know, every patient is different. And no, there's no, you get, you get into troubles when you think every patient is going to react the same way to an infection. Um, but it, typically for flu, it's, it's a short-lived um, illness. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, how long does the flu season typically last? We can, you know, it varies every year. And sometimes flu season starts earlier, it can start in December, um, but sometimes uh, we don't see flu season really um, peak until February and sometimes even into March. We've also noticed, even, even though it's not typical flu season, um, we even identify flu viruses circulating in the summertime um, as well. Okay. Are there any known concerns with regard to the timing of a flu vaccine and the upcoming COVID-19 vaccine? Um, I'm not sure I understand, you know, I understand the question completely, but um, no, you know, I think the general guidance is that flu vaccination can continue during the period when COVID vaccination becomes available, and we really think it's an important. Yeah, I, I, I do think the question was about that they're both, um, you know, being released a similar timing and getting them both um, at a similar time. Do prescription eyeglasses provide any kind of protection? <laughs> I'm not sure uh, what that was in reference to. MJ had asked that. Yeah, I think maybe that's in terms of the PPE. I would not consider eyeglasses um, appropriate eye protection. Okay. And along the same lines, why are the N95 masks not recommended? Currently in my long-term care setting, we are required to wear them at all times up to 16 hours a day. Well, I think that uh, um, some of this, and I, I'm not you know, this is a separate group that to develop these guidelines, but N95s, I think, were typically reserved for um, aerosolizing procedures. For what kind of procedures? Aerosolizing so, procedures, so if you were intubating patients, for example. And you would you, then it's recommended. 
Yeah, and, and you can refer to the CDC website that talks through a lot of that as well. Um, there is information regarding PPE on the CDC website, especially in healthcare settings. Um, you know, there may be different um, facility level policies as well. Okay. Is it mandatory for preschool children to get a flu vaccine? Um, you know, typically um, vaccination policies are at a state jurisdiction level. Um, CDC does not have any mandatory um, um, guidelines. Okay. Do you know, are there any software tools to help with creating maps and flow chart, charts for clinics? Uh, this person has access to real opt for pods, which is great for planning and staffing, but for a physical map to go into an IAP document, any recommendations or known platforms you would suggest? So, um, you, and, and maybe this was early, I mean, we do have some flow charts on the CDC website. I showed some examples of those. but. Um, I think maybe the question it was asking for me a little bit more detailed. I'm not sure um, that there's, you know, more detailed physical maps at this point because I think that there's such variability in the, um, you know, how, how, what a facility is going to look like. I, I got the impression from reading it that they were asking about software that would be good for them to use to create their own maps and flowcharts. You know, I am not aware of any software like that, um, but I know that there's a lot of creative folks out there. It's a it's a good question, but I'm not aware. I'm sorry. Okay, All right. What is the purpose of the waiting time after vaccination? Is it to monitor possible bad reactions? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's just to um, I think to make sure there's no um, anaphylaxis um, that obviously. You would, want, you would not want someone to be by themselves and alone at that point. Do you think it is safe to conduct COVID-19 testing and also offer drive-through flu shots at the same site? I don't, you know, I think that this is one of the things that there's going to be clinical guidance coming out at the time. Um, I think you've got to be really careful because um, there's a lot of people that are seeking testing are symptomatic, and so you want to you got to be really careful cohorting sick and well patients. Um, obviously, you want well patients to be getting um, immunized. Right. Funny, you call up your doctor's office and you say I'm sick, and they say sorry if you're sick you can't come in. <laughs> um, well. Uh, let me ask you, Sam, those were the only questions that we had from the audience. I, I did notice that there were some additional slides here. Was that information that you wanted to relay to the audience? We do have some time. Well, sure. I, I think those were just a few backup slides. It's a little bit more detail. So this slide just breaks it down some of the, the, the disparity in influence of vaccination coverage. And by age, race and ethnic groups, the age group. So you'll see, and even among high-risk conditions, um, unfortunately, we see the same trend. Um, uh, black, non-Hispanics, and Hispanic populations tend to have lower vaccination coverage across the board than, um, than their white um, counterparts. And this is a really a problem because we got to get those rates up. These are the same groups that are unfortunately disproportionately affected by severe flu and severe COVID-19. And this is just a nice slide from the CDC website that's available that, that highlights some of these um, kind of um, disparities, the differences in, among racial and ethnic groups you know, for COVID-19 in terms of number of cases and hospitalizations. and. In addition, you know, some of this is constantly updated. I, I believe even this slide, I think we developed this more than a month ago, so it's probably even um, there's more newer information as well. Okay. Oops. Oh, and this is just examples if we're asked about, you know, when we talk about 
groups that are high risk for medical conditions for severe flu. Um, these, these are the groups. Um, so you can you can take a look there, and I, I think we addressed most of these in our earlier slides. Are they similar to the groups for COVID-19 that we've been hearing about for the last uh, nine months or so? Right. There's a lot of similarities. I think one of the things that we noticed you know, that was really unique to COVID so far, and we're obviously things are rapidly evolving and we get more and more information all the time, but the, um, you know, hypertension seems to be unique to COVID-19, and, and we don't really understand why. Good to know, though. And then I believe this might be the last slide. And yeah, this is a, just a slide showing. Um, this is uh, um, by week of the last season. Um, the influenza positive tests reported to CDC by clinical laboratories. Um, so th there are you know two major strains of flu. There's influenza A and influenza B. And yellow is influenza A, and B is um, is in green.